This is Maddie Rempe from Cleveland, Ohio, and you're listening to Barbecue Central. So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Welcome to the really big Barbecue Central Show! This is the show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling. Of course, we broadcast live and direct from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio. I am Greg Rempe, your humble host. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday evening. And boy, is this show, as they say, a doozy. Lots to talk about, lots of people to get with this evening. But before we do any of that, if you would like to take part in this show this evening, you can do it one of two ways, and here's how you do it. You can get in touch with the show by calling 216-220-0966. Email Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. On the Twitter and Instagram, at BBQ Central Show. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, thebbqcentralshow.com. And here's what's coming up in case you didn't get the newsletter. And yes, I did send it out twice. The first one was on accident. It was supposed to go at 1,600 hours today. And for whatever reason, I didn't change the PM, or I didn't change the AM to PM. So as soon as I hit schedule, it went immediately out because it was well behind the time. And then I decided to resend it again at 6 o'clock because I have a large allotment of newsletters that I can send each and every month given to my program, but I don't like to just bombard it. So that's why you typically will only see one newsletter on Tuesday around 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Anyway, long way to say here's what's happening on the show tonight. Coming up in about 12 minutes from now, the usual fourth Tuesday of the month guest because the normal third Tuesday of the guest was going, uh, third Tuesday guest is going to be in a very loud dinner-type venue. Said he could make it work if he had to, but would appreciate a pushback. So I reached out to this guy and said, hey, can I switch you to a week earlier? There are some things we can talk about. He said, absolutely. So with my undying thanks, Max Good from AmazingRibs.com joins us at 914. I don't know if you follow the competition scene at all, but this weekend is one of the biggest weekends in the competition year or season. At nine four, uh, 9.35, we're going to catch up with four-time, one of only two teams, they can say that, by the way, four-time Memphis in May World Grand Champion and pitmaster of Big Bob Gibson's Barbecue Hall of Famer Chris Lilly joins us to get a preview of the upcoming weekend, and then we'll move into the second hour at 10.14. A guest who has a very unique service that uh, does provide an actual product that you would consume, namely steak, but more and more people are becoming conscious about where is my meat coming from? How do I know that Mr. Butcher from random super big store is actually telling me the truth. I want to be able to track it back to whence it began all the way up to the culling moment. And you're going to become part of that culling moment. It's a company called Crowd Cow. I mean, everybody knows that crowdfunding has like been the latest craze over the last couple of years. Your pet dies hey, go fund me so I can buy a new pet. I want new equipment for my internet radio show. I started to go fund me and people pay me stuff so I can buy. Not the same, similar concept from an ultra high level. It's going to take a group of people and I'm not going to give away the whole shot here. 
But if you're interested in really wanting to know where your meat came from, you're going to want to stay tuned at 1014 because one of the co-founders, Joe Heitzberg, will be joining us from Crowd Cow. Crowd Cow. Cow. Crowdcow.com. And then at 1035, we will re-pick up with the upcoming Memphis and May talk this weekend and visit with a three-time world overall Memphis and May grand champion, a whole hog pig expert. Perhaps, oh, that's going to be fighting words, but perhaps nobody better than she is. Also, does very well in the ribs category, sauce category. When you look up Memphis and May wins, whether it be in category and or overall, she's right there at the top. Melissa Cookston, Yazoo's Delta Q, closing the show, bringing the heat out of the bullpen. So that's what you have lined up this evening. Max Good, Chris Lilly, Hall of Famer, Joe Heitzberg, Crowd Cow, Melissa Cookston, Yazoo's Delta Q, a lot of Memphis and May talk, some cow tipping talk, and some Traeger Timberline talk coming up out of the first break. It could be one of the best shows on tap in recent memory. All right. With that being said, let everybody know the show is live and on the air. Get on the Facebook, the Twitter, the Pinterest, the Google+. Plus. Send them over to OutdoorCookingChannel.com, longtime video syndication partner of the show. Send them over to my website, TheBBQCentralShow.com for audio. And you can also send them over to the Roku if that's what they're watching. Go to the App Store, look for Outdoor Cooking Channel, and away you go. A lot of people asking me over the past week, hey, hey. What happened in the second hour? Uh -oh. Hey, everybody, what happened? I think I had like a black eye. Well, here's what happened. Hmm. Phone call. Three minutes left. Phone call. Three minutes left. Phone call. Hmm. This is going to go against my better judgment, I know. This can't be Max, right? Well, let's see what happens. Uh, go ahead. You're on the air. Hello. Did I miss it? All right. Missed it. Sorry. I was coming to get you. Hello. Hello. All right. Let's try it again. All right. You're on the air. Thanks for signing up for Cat Facts. You will now receive fun daily facts about cats. <laughs> what? To cancel receiving Cat Facts, please press 9 now. <laughs> Cat facts uh -oh. did not just happen on my show, but it did. By the way, that sounded like crap. That cat facts sounded like crap facts. Let me get to options here right quick. Let's go to audio. Let's go to speakers. Oh, no. All right. Hold on. Got to remedy the situation. Right here, right now. Let's do it. All right. Stand by. Man. That was the one thing I didn't check when I rebooted. Let's see how it sounds like now. All right, like magic. Let me make sure that all my encoders are working properly and that I have all the right sound going. All right. Beautiful. All right. So <clears throat> what happened last week? I cannot believe I just got a cat thing. Like that did not happen. Cat facts. Who would send me cat facts? Oh, that's an open-ended question. Here's what happened. I was getting, I was ending the, sh uh, the segment, the dual segment with Meathead as we usually do on a Tuesday. Once to get off the line with him, it froze. So here's what happened, I think, and you computer experts can go ahead and debate the validity of this statement or not. But most of the time, the Tower of Power is running. I'll shut my monitors off, but the Tower of Power is running in case I need to access it uh, at the immediate test of me or uh, on remote. Who knows? So what I needed to do, or what I think happened here, is that there were things happening in the background. And for whatever reason, hanging up with Meathead on Skype 
triggered it. They came right to the forefront, systematically started shutting one program down to the next program to the next program right at the top of the second hour. And I was able to finally get everything closed and restarted. That took 35 to 40 minutes, but in enough time for me to pull up Clarence Joseph. Now, in podcast, I went ahead and made that edit, so it just sounds like I went from one thing to the next, and it was a little disjointed, but by and large, easy listening. But that's what happened. So I made sure, I made a promise, said, hey, from now on, every Tuesday, you're going to restart the computer, start fresh on a reboot. Here's what we did this Tuesday, and we are off and running. Congratulations to Andrew Deese. He's live. Deese what? Deese not. Hey, folks, let me talk to you quickly about Cook Shack, manufacturers of smoker ovens for barbecue lovers with any amount of barbecue experience. Whether you barbecue in the backyard, on the competition circuit, or in a five-star dining facility, Cook Shack has a unit that will do the job, and with a full line of barbecue sauces, spices, pellets, and wood chunks, it is the perfect one-stop shop. Cook Shack strives to be your barbecue resource center by offering cooking classes, online recipes, how-to videos, two blogs, smoke and grilling 101s, and a video cooking classroom. Check out their website, cookshack.com, or follow them on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, Google+. Get advice or share your passion for barbecue on the World Class Barbecue Forum. They still have one of those. Cook Shack pellet-fired smokers are the choice of champions because they were designed by a champion. Ed Fast Eddie Morin, the FEC 100, PG 1000, always customer favorites. The PG 1000 can double as a smoker and grill, low and slow, hot and fast. The pellet grill line gives you the most for your money. Cook Shack Residential Electric Smokers, the number one smoker in the industry. High quality means high durability and versatility. Anything you can cook in your oven, you can make in a Cook Shack. Passion, dedication drives Cook Shack's manufacturing, with quality always being at the forefront. Get the best in barbecue since 1962. Call 800-423-0698. That's 800-423-0698. Or again, visit the website cookshack.com. That's cookshack.com. There's another phone call coming in. Uh, I guarantee, unless I'm making the phone calls, I will not be answering the phone. <laughs> I will not. They're they're coming in hot and fast right now. I'm not answering your phone calls. It's that simple, folks. It's not happening. All right. All right. Max Good coming up out of the break. Stick around. We'll be right back. Live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, welcome back. This portion of the show is being brought to you by Smithfield. You love to barbecue, you love to compete, you love to win. Do all three with Smithfield since 1938. Smithfield producing high-quality fresh pork products. They now invite you to get smoking with Smithfield if you're a competitive barbecuer. You can join the Committed Cooks program. Members who commit to cooking with premium hand-trimmed Smithfield fresh pork will receive swag and other great prizes. Commit to cooking with Smithfield. See what's going on at smokingwithsmithfield.com. That's smoking with smithfield.com all right let me see if i can find where mr max is 
this this other phone call is really starting to annoy me. Hey, uh, usually you see this guy on the fourth Tuesday of the month. However, he's doing me an incredible favor coming on in a week early to accommodate a request from the normal third Tuesday of the month guest. He's the resident keeper of the flame at AmazingRibs.com. What grills should you be looking at? What smokers should you be looking at? Get ready to hit the market, all that stuff. Industry rumors, scuttlebutt maybe. Who knows? That's why we head on over and talk to our good friend, Max Good at uh, AmazingRibs.com. Max, how are you, buddy? All right. How you doing, Greg? I'm doing absolutely fabulous, Max. Appreciate you making time as always. Actually, I really appreciate you not only making time, but making time a week in advance. Well, it's always a pleasure to chat with you, my friend. All right. Well, I appreciate all of that good stuff. And uh, so let me uh, ask you right off the bat, we're going to be talking a lot about Traeger Timberline here <laughs> in our segment. But has there anything, uh, has is, has there been anything else that has graced the testing table that uh, either really has you excited to get on or you've tried out recently that has really either drawn your ire or really could be a praiseworthy piece? Oh, gosh. I think we've talked about uh, many of the things that, that I've been testing over the past few months. Yeah. Um, I, I can't think of anything new that you and I haven't already discussed. Uh, um, What's in the queue? Uh, oh, uh, uh, that um, Charbroil uh, Commander Kamado, the low-cost Kamado. Mm -hmm. That's been uh, sitting in the background for a while. I already tested their uh, Smart Chef uh, True Infrared Gas Grill, which really was disappointing to me because I had some such high hopes for it. <laughs> Um, and I have to write that one up, but it got pushed on the onto the back burner. Ha ha ha! I get it. Uh, they they claim they're trying to do some upgrades. Um, uh, there's a lot of technology out there these days, and Timberline's a good example of that. Uh, but that uh, Charbroil Smart Chef gas grill, uh, it was supposed to be a a, a a thermostatically controlled gas grill, and it really didn't work well at all. Now the the upside or the good news is they should be able to upgrade it uh, remotely because uh, there are ways that they can change the programs. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure what they did with that. They just shot me an email today and I said, look, I, I'm getting ready to write this one up. Have you made any improvements? You know, um, we're going to get there one of these days, Greg. We're going to have thermostatically control controlled gas grills that don't cost a million bucks. Oh, okay. Uh, I believe in other areas of the country, they're called ovens. <laughs> <laughs> Indoor ovens, yeah. That's right. Why can't they have? Why can't we have outdoor Why ovens? Why not? You know? That's what I say. All right, uh, so let's dive headlong into this. There's been quite the buzz in the industry. There's been some uh, time that has gone by between when we think it's going to launch and then it's pushed back and then it's pushed back. Mm -hmm. And we saw it at HPB Expo in Atlanta a couple months ago, but it technically hadn't launched officially then. But you were able to see it, touch it, feel it. It is the Traeger Timberline. It is out. It is for sale. I believe it comes in at least two different models, maybe three. That's we'll correct. get into that here in a second. Um, just overall, your take from a high level on Traeger Timberline, and is it uh, breaking any molds or pushing the envelope when it comes to pellet cooking? Well, for Traeger, it certainly is. It's much more technologically advanced than any of their other models. Uh, the, uh, the, the controller... Uh, can be uh, accessed remotely with a Wi-Fi system. You download the Traeger app to your smartphone, and it's Android or iOS, and it's cloud-enabled, so you could be driving all over the place and monitor and even control the the smoker uh, from from anywhere, basically. So it's really cool uh, th that side of it. It's it's built beautifully. It, it's a uh, very solid. Uh, very well insulated, big, 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 sturdy and heavy uh, uh, coated steel on the outside, thick coated steel, all stainless steel interior for the double wall uh, design. So there's a lot of good things about it. My my uh, my biggest beef about it, boy, I'm full of puns tonight, is that it's <laughs> it doesn't uh, do very well with poultry. My biggest beef is poultry. <laughs> How can that be? Uh, well, I don't know. It just wouldn't crisp in, and I did 
four four tests. I did wings. Yeah. I did thighs. All right. I did uh, two two sets of two chickens, <laughs> whole chickens. Uh, this time of year, it's kind of hard to get turkey, so that aren't frozen. And you know, uh, I thought I got to, I I was able to get really big chickens, and I did two at a time to to take into account the 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 mass of the, of the meat being in there. Um, it it wasn't like completely rubber skin, but it was it was uh, kind of chewy and pale and no matter what I did you know I talked to the guys at Traeger and I said well I normally cook at 325 they said goose it up to 350 no. I talked to Dr. Blonder uh, our science advisor and he said well you know um, with a pellet smoker or any kind of smoker heat and smoke kind of uh, collects in, in the hood at the top yeah. why don't you get it up as high as you can uh, and I did that. Nothing made any change at all. It was extremely juicy. Everything I cooked on it was really moist and juicy, and I never once used a water pan. Uh, but I don't. I feel like there's something there. Like maybe you got to just crank it to its maximum temperature when you're doing poultry. But um, uh, I couldn't get it, and I talked to the guys at Traeger, and they couldn't give me the magic key either. So that was a disappointment. And on the upside, though. Uh, it was a superb smoker when you're smoking down low and slow, and it's big. It's big. It's it's got this. Um, I call them stadium-shaped sides, race truck-shaped sides. It's the the hood is really tall, high profile to accommodate three racks. It's like a cabinet smoker. You know, you got low, medium, and high rack. Um, and if you want to load it up with ribs or briskets or Come throw some ribs on one rack, throw brisket on another, throw pork shoulder on the other. In some smokers, uh, there's there's certain sectors that are hotter. Like maybe the bottom is hotter than the top, or vice versa, and you have to swap meats out. The design they call it the downdraft design uh, is such that it really creates very even heat from top to bottom and left to right. And we can talk mm. in detail about how that's achieved, but. Um, it's it's as a as a low and slow smoker, I I can't say enough good things about it. Uh, the controller is very versatile, has a lot of options on. It's a little more complex than most pellet smoker controllers. Um, so maybe I'll take a breath here and see if you have any questions. <laughs> well, yeah. So I think one of the I don't know if it was well known or not, but one of the things that I kind of know for, from the inside, the thing that was delaying the release was the technology to a certain degree mm -hmm. and making sure that it worked. So from your perspective and your testing does, while the tech sounding is very impressive with things that you can do, does it actually perform in the field after you pay the money and get it into the deck? Well, uh, they gave me a beta model and uh, there was, it seems it seems like, as you mentioned, the rollout kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. Uh, so when I finally got the first model, um, it was like number five of 250. And of course, I was very excited to get that. And when I put it together, once again, the construction is superb. So as I'm assembling it, I'm going, wow, this is nice. Uh, but I couldn't get the the smartphone, my smartphone to sync up to the grill very well. You have to download the app and then create a user account, mm -hmm. and then you have to pair up your smartphone to the grill. And there, we had a world of problems with that. They finally sent a couple guys out from Michigan with a, with a production model. They said, part of the problem is that we gave you this beta model and that we're tweaking it already, you know, and we're moving our servers around. And so now you have to create a new account and Okay, and I'm going all right. I know it's new. I know it's new. I'm I'm believing in you guys. You I have respect for Traeger. Uh, and once we got it right, it was beautiful and continues to be beautiful. I definitely uh, I have had once we got over the hump, <laughs> I have had no problems with the app or the controller. One, so I anticipate that that has been resolved. One of the things that was really hyped to me uh, by Luke Edgar at Traeger when I was at HPB was the fact that you were going to be able to uh, 
get recipes right from the mm-hmm. cooker, pulling it down from the cloud or the internet or you know whatever you want to call it. Uh, have you had success with that or have you played around with um, that at all? I, I fiddled with it. I didn't actually use them. They, right now they only have two recipes, uh, one for brisket and one for chicken. <laughs> The brisket recipe is a better illustration of what they're talking about. As I recall, um, it starts out at 165. Of course, uh, with pellet smokers, when you're smoking at a low temperature range, you get more smoke because the pellets get a chance to smolder. So it, it runs at 165. If you use their programmed recipe for brisket for about three and a half hours, as I recall, and then it gooses up the temp, the cooking temp to 225. Meanwhile, it has an integrated meat probe which you can monitor as well from the from the grill or from your app. And uh, it starts beeping when you hit 190 internal meat temp, which I don't believe, I, th- I, I think you really want to get up above 200 in my view. I, I don't think you're going to be pleased with a brisket that's at 190 internal temp. But be that as it may, uh, you can you can use those the, that those recipes and you can create your own and save them. Uh, I'm sure they are going to come up with more uh, going forward. Uh, but that's not exactly new. I think some of the other pellet smokers have that as well. It's, it, it is new for Traeger. The app is very well designed, very well thought out. Uh, it's a pleasure to use. It's easy to use after we got it all set. Uh, people that are going to get into a system like this uh, I, I might – Think about if if they're having connectivity problems, um, everybody's singing the same song to me. Get a Wi-Fi booster. Now I move the the grill closer to where my uh, my router is, and that seemed to work okay for me. But uh, it's something on my on my uh, list, Greg, is to get a Wi-Fi booster because it looks like we're going to see more and more of these. And I welcome that. I welcome the ability. Uh, to to have this kind of monitoring and even control of a system remotely. Max Good joining me from AmazingRibs.com. Uh, we're uh, getting through time here, so let's uh, hit all the, the hot spots here. You had mentioned it a couple minutes ago, downdraft technology. Talk to me about that. Okay. Um, again, the, the lid is very high profile. It's not a barrel shape. It's a race. Tr- the sides are like a racetrack, and you have the low, medium, and high rack in it. Uh, the back of the of the grill, all the all those state solid stainless steel grill grates, uh, there's an opening at the back, there's an opening uh, on the drip pan above the fire pot that allows uh, the the heat and smoke to shoot up the back of the grill. And when it hits that high hood, it comes back down t- towards the front of the grill and then There is no chimney. There's just an exhaust vent that runs across the back underneath the lower grate level, and that's where the heat and smoke exits. So you have this circular motion, and it really works great. the, The heat is extremely even from top to bottom, and because of that lack of a chimney where it would concentrate the exhaust uh, in, uh, to one side or to the center or whatever, right, right. you have that wide, that opening from left to right. It, it also mitigates uh, uneven temps from left to right. Um, that's what they call the downdraft. No problem when you have it loaded down with airflow, getting in between the pieces and all that stuff, because typically that might be an issue with some of the other cookers. Well, you know, I, I didn't go nuts, I must admit. Uh, I imagine you could overload them. <laughs> if you went too far but uh, you know if you take that into account and don't uh, uh, be too excessive uh, the, I experienced very even heat top to bottom left to right all right talk to me about the models that are available well the one I tested was the 850 and that's their I, I hesitate to call it small because it is not small I'd say it's a mid-size uh, version There is a larger one that's a 1300 that obviously has bigger racks, bigger, bigger smoke box, bigger racks. Um, Another downside with this system is that now most pellet smokers don't do well at high temperature cooking. They some of them have these little searing schemes that work okay. Some work pretty good. Um, The Timberline, the lower grate has 
two positions. There's a higher position for smoking, and then you can drop it down right above the drip tray, uh, and that's supposed to give you higher temps. And it does give you slightly higher temps, but um, yeah, like most pellet smokers, it, it really doesn't sear well. Uh, and also, when you let's say I did I did some hamburgers on it. Every time I opened the lid and flip them, man, the temperature would just drop. And if you set this thing to 500, it takes forever to to get up into the upper 400 range. And you open that lid, boom, it really drops, and then it takes forever to regain. So it's a uh, it's a little it's not really. It's not really good for high temperature cooking. Uh, I guess it depends on what you're trying to do. But I talked to uh, some of the folks at Traeger, and they, of course, said, well, you throw a cast iron skillet in there. Because what, I, I did steaks subsequently on them, and they really looked anemic. Um, so I brought them in when once they hit 130 internal meat temperature. I brought them inside and seared them up on a pan on the stove. Uh, so they said, well, you could do that out there. Put a cast iron pan out there. Put some grow grates. Right, Brad? Right. If your grill grates are work. Right. Everybody loves grill grates on their pellet smoker. Um, but you, you really, if you have any hope of getting any sear out of it, you you need to remember, <laughs> you need some help. Uh, talk to me about price between the, the introductory model and the bigger model. Boy, you know, I don't know the big one. The, the 850 that I have is uh, about 1700 bucks. I don't know that they're cutting any deals on these yet. Uh, I don't recall what the bigger one is. Uh, whoops, but it's certainly more than that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, maybe in the twenty-four to, to twenty-five hundred dollar range, uh, I, I, maybe I more than that. To say, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't really. I just finished the the review today, um, and uh, I apologize. I don't have that information for you. That's fine. Seventeen hundred is uh, good enough for the model that most people would probably get mm -hmm. their hands on anyway. Availability wise, uh, is this thing located in dealers, uh, big box stores, online only? What do you know? Uh, I, I, my understanding is it is that um, some of their distributors, you know, they don't really have a lot of presence in the big box stores. I mean, they have some Ace Hardwares, but they're kind of a different animal too. They have, uh, you know, some of the sports places like uh, Bass Pro or you know those kind of places. And then they have independent dealers as well, and they are available online. I think there's, as I recall, they're sold out of the large 1300 model uh, right now. But uh, I imagine they'll be getting some more in. All right, last question, minute and a half left. Where does this rank as far as smokers being good, bad, or ugly on AmazingRibs.com? Uh, I'm going to give it our silver medal, which is kind of, you know, our gold is the top. Um, it is a little pricey. I'm not saying it's not worth it. I, uh, I didn't expect it to sear well, and my expectations were met. I uh, was on, I was disappointed with the performance uh, with poultry. So I thought all in all, uh, I, 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 the, the app is outstanding. It's a pleasure to use. You know, you're sitting there in bed. You wake up in the middle of the night. Oh, how's it going? Well, it's going just fine. That's great. Or, if you're driving around, you go, holy mackerel, that's getting done. Uh, there's a button you can press on your app or on the grill that just says keep warm. Boom, you oh. press that, it goes, drops to 165 and holds it. There's a lot of great things to like about it. Um, uh, there's gold I, potential. I, there's gold potential down the road. Um, Maybe. Yeah, well, it's it's already very good. It's yeah. already very good. Uh, but uh, I, I felt like... Uh, I guess that that experience with the poultry, knowing many people want to cook turkeys and you know poultry of various types in their smokers, uh, unless we find the solution here, that I think people were, are going to be disappointed in that particular uh, performance. All right, Max Good is over at AmazingRibs.com. He is the keeper of the flame. We've been talking about the Traeger Timberline here this evening. Max, always appreciate the time and thanks again for uh, doing me the solid and coming on a week early. And we will talk to you again next month okay anything for you my friend thank you that's max good right there that's right max good don't even think twice about it. all guests on the barbecue central show appear via the smithfield hotline yummy all right uh the timberline gets the silver medal for its debut the chops power injector however is the 2015, 16, and 17 Barbecue Tool of the Year. 
That's right, they come in three awesome sizes to fit your injecting needs from the backyard hacks like me to the competition guys and restaurant chefs like you. Number one seller, half gallon chops power injector system designed for competition guys or to pump up the backyard warrior. Easy to use, clean it, fill it, pump it, away you go. Just have one brisket or pork shoulder to do. You don't need to fill it all the way up. Just put in what you need, it uses it all. Comes with a whole bunch of stuff. It costs a hundred bucks and you pay the shipping. The one gallon chops power injector system is designed for catering and bigger jobs. It holds double the amount of the injection of the half gallon. That's what I meant to say. Some use it in competitions like cooking MBN whole hog or 10 shoulders to find that perfect one. This one also comes with a bunch of stuff. It costs 120 bucks plus you pay shipping. Then you have the CHOPS full power injector system. It's electric and is the commercial and competition big daddy. It's not a holding tank this time, but a three and a half foot pickup tube that you can put in any size container from a few ounces to a 55 gallon drum. It was designed for Chef Rob at the best barbecue restaurant in Kansas City. He said time and time again that with the CHOPS full power injector system, his briskets are better than ever and they come with a whole bunch of stuff. It's 325 bucks, plus you pay the shipping. A number of the top pitmasters in the country and world use the CPI system every day to make their barbecue better than the rest because we live in a foodie world that requires flavor in every bite. This is how you do it and do it fast. Not just for meat either. How about injecting alcohol into watermelon this summer? Yeah, you can do that. Every injector hand assembled right there in Kansas City, Missouri, USA. They got all the accessories that you want. You can even get this great upgrade to make your CHOPS injector bulletproof, metal needle adapters. Go to BarbecueKansasCity.com. That's B-A-R-B-E-Q-U-E, BarbecueKansasCity.com. CHOPS power injector systems. Give your barbecue some power. Chris Lilly coming up next to talk a little Memphis in May this weekend. Stick around. We'll be right back. Now, let's get back to the LeBron James and Barbecue Talk, Craig Rampey. All right, thanks again to Max Good for joining me this past segment. This portion of the show being brought to you by Green Mountain Grills, manufacturers of some of the best pellet cookers out there on the market today. If you're looking for a big cooker to house a lot of food, they got one for you. If you're looking for something medium size, they got you covered there too. Also, something to take on tailgates or camping trips, no problem, they got it. They can also supply you with pellets to fire those cookers as well. Check them out at GreenMountainGrills.com. That's GreenMountainGrills.com. I love my Green Mountain Grill. You can love yours as well. All right, my next guest is one of only two pitmasters that can lay claim to being a four-time grand champion at Memphis in May. He is also a successful cookbook author and, of course, uh, most well-known for keeping the Big Bob Gibson's name known throughout the barbecue land. You can also catch him on this show from time to time as well. We look ahead this coming weekend, among other things, to the Memphis in May 2017 version. It is 2016 Barbecue Hall of Famer and friend of the show, I might point out. Chris Lilly joining me here. Recording, oh, hang boy. Or press one for oh, more options. Okay, all right. <clears throat> you know... Few things are more mm, of a letdown. Can you say letdown? Few things are more of a letdown to going through that really big introduction and then getting voicemail. Well, you know, it happens. We'll just uh, give him a ring here again. Hmm. Oh, that's not good. Where's my phone at? Let's see here. Chris, you there, Chris? Yeah, yeah. Here he is. Chris, I didn't know if you knew it or not. But, oh, she's gone. Hello? 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 
This is short side segment too. I hate that. I hate the short side segment. Time quickly trickling by. A big introduction. Memphis in May to talk about. Who knows what's going to be happening next. All right, let's try it again. He's out in Decatur. You know, reception could be bad. Who knows? I'm going, I'm not even Hello? fine. Hey, Chris. Hey. There he is. Here we go. So, I don't know if you knew it or not, but big weekend coming up. A little Memphis in May action. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey. Absolutely. I'm yeah. I'm I'm packed and ready to go. Are you? You're all ready. Well, uh <laughs> as you much better. as I can be, I guess. I got my truck packed, uh and so we're leaving out tomorrow early mo- or early morning. Uh Chris, I guess before we, you know, really look into the impending weekend, if we could get nostalgic just for a second and have a look back at the four overall grand championship wins that you've amassed over your time at Memphis and May. You know, I imagine they hold uh, all of them, uh, special places in your competition heart, but is there one that would sit above the rest for one reason or another? You know, it's it's almost got to be the first one. Uh, you know, it's definitely so special, not only for me, but the entire Big Bob Gibson team. And, um, and uh, yeah, without a doubt, getting called up on the big stage and, and then getting the final call, you know, your first one, you know, has to always go down as the best one. Chris Lilly joining me here from Big Bob Gibson's uh, Memphis and May, obviously one of the biggest contests that takes place each year. Many pit masters hope to take down that overall title before they put out the pits for good, if you will. So for the folks who maybe have never been or might be considering making the trek down to Memphis this weekend to check it out, what do you think, in your opinion, is so special about this event when you compare it to some of those other bigger ones that take place during the course of the year? It's it's just so different. Uh, all the big contests, Memphis and May, the, uh, the American Royal, Jack Daniels, Houston Livestock and Rodeo Show, you know, those are generally considered the, your four big ones. Um, they're all so different. So I would encourage everybody to go take in every one of them. Um, Memphis and May is different in that uh, a lot of the teams are a little more inviting than they are at some of the other contests. Uh, you know, you gotta you got to realize that some of the um, – you know, some of the judging is, you know, on site. So teams are set up to be welcoming and to, uh, you know, have people over. So uh, there's a lot of parties, a lot of music, and a lot of cooking, even before the contest. So people cook all day, Thursday, Friday, and then uh, get busy Friday night for Saturday for the contest. But uh, gosh, there's food and fun for days, days ahead. Um, <laughs> the funny thing in Memphis is, you know, you'd think Friday night and Saturday nights would be your big party night, but Saturday night is dead because people are so spent from hanging out all day, Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday, all night long. So it's by Saturday night, everybody's spent, so they're back in the hotel rooms. Chris, you know, from a, from a rookie team standpoint, uh, do people ask you, hey, if I show up on a Wednesday or a Thursday to, to do that load in and take part in some of these parties and goings on, do you do you tell them, hey, make sure that if you're going to get your fun in, find that cutoff point, make sure that you focus on this competition? Because in the end, this is a competition you're going there to win. <laughs> oh, it definitely is. Uh you know, and, and that's that's a good thing about having a team uh, that you can delegate and hand out duties. So if I'm going to be hanging out and partying all night uh, on Thursday night, you know, you better believe uh, Friday night, you know, I'm, 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 you know, getting down to business. So you've got your uh, – everybody does their own jobs. It's a team effort to win Memphis in May. Uh, so, uh, everybody's, you know, expected to do, do their job. And, um, and, you know, part of that is having, having fun when uh when they're supposed to be having fun and all business when when we're supposed to get down and try to win this thing chris you've been doing this contest for a number of years you've won it uh, four times overall you've had a lot of category wins does it ever get old or is getting ready for this coming weekend in 2017 do you still find that same excitement that same nervousness that same anticipation that you did when you were first doing 
To, to be honest with you, uh, I don't. Uh, it, it's not a nervousness or anticipation uh, at this point of the week. I'm barely even thinking about the contest itself. I'm more uh, ready to get down there, get settled, um, and uh, and you know, start having a good time with uh, friends and family. Start cooking, just enjoying the week. You know, it's so much work packing and moving everything down there and set up. We went down there Sunday to do a preliminary setup of all our equipment and uh, fencing and tents and everything, and I'm back for good tomorrow. But there's so much work involved. I'm just I'm just excited to get down there and kick my heels up and just relax a little bit. I'll start thinking about the contest on Friday evening when it's time to start prepping the pork. So nervousness and anticipation not really not really a part of it at this stage, but it will be come come Saturday morning. Chris Lilly, Barbecue Hall of Famer, joining me here on the show. Chris, a few years ago, we were chatting about a win that you had taken down, and it was unique in the fact that you did it with frozen pork butts. Uh, first time you had done that, a meat <laughs> purveyor didn't come through, and you were kind of uh, grasping to to fill that need, and ultimately it ends up working out for you. You guys all said as far as proteins are concerned <laughs> for this weekend. My pork did come in, without a doubt. I got some beautiful pork. It is uh, it is a Smithfield Duroc product that I'm excited about cooking this year at Memphis in May. So, uh, and it looked fantastic. Great color, great marbling, and that's the two things I look for when I look for outstanding pork. And I'm um, excited about cooking it up this year, you know, f for the judges. It is fresh. It is thawed, never frozen, and uh, and I have it in hand, so it's in my coolers, ready to ready to haul down there tomorrow morning. Chris, a number of years ago, we had talked about how you had a pretty good run for a number of years in a row, and you kind of uh, got a little comfortable with what you were doing program wise and, and flavor profile wise, and then you started asking around, and ultimately you ended up being maybe a guy that wasn't saucing his pork, and everybody else was, and you made adjustments, you started you gotta, hitting again. You got a good memory. <laughs> I like to do my homework, you know? I got to do this. So have there been any adjustments between uh, last Memphis in May and this Memphis in May that you've instituted to give yourself the best shot at winning? Yeah, I actually did. Uh, and I posted, I cooked a couple of uh, pork shoulders um, outside on my Jed Master, right outside my restaurant, uh, just to uh, just to knock the rust off because I don't do very many of these uh, contests uh, anymore. Uh, but I did um, I did try a cut. I'm using the same injection, of course, but uh, but I did try a couple different sauce combinations. Um, uh, tweaked my sauce a couple different ways, and then uh, tried that out as a finishing sauce. And at Memphis in May, you not only if you're going to glaze your pork, you know when it comes off uh, comes off the cooker, or glaze your pork on the cooker to serve. Uh, Memphis and May gives you the opportunity of turning in sauce on the side with your turn ins. So you can turn in up to two sauces. So you've got to not only, um, you know, think about what sauce you put on your pork, but you've got to think about what sauces, if any, that you're going to turn in with your pork. And that strategy in itself. Do you come to expect the same group of folks to be at the finals, the Jack Sold South, the Yazoos, the folks at the Shed, the Sweet Swine? Uh, this does seem to be an event where, you know, a lot of the same teams seem to be kind of there at the end. And obviously that's a, a nod to consistency being a key factor in doing this. Uh, do you kind of come to expect to see the, a same group of people year in, year out? I certainly wouldn't be surprised to see some of those names you mentioned in the finals, but uh, but there'll be some new teams too. Uh, you know, this is getting um, uh, so tough out there, and there's some so there's some great new teams coming on. We'll see a few of them in the finals today, but uh, or this weekend. But uh, but yeah, I think the reason that you hear some of those same names, whether it be at Memphis in May, or whether it be at the American Royal, or whether it be you know, at some of these other big contests is because, you know, there's some teams out there that uh, that are consistent and everything they do is about consistency and about controlling all the factors that go into, uh, you know, cooking these things. So it's the teams that are that are the most consistent, that, that are the most successful. Uh, so that's what basically what I try to do. I, I try to be consistent. If I can control every factor that goes into cooking my pork, 
my pork's just going to be just as good as it was last year at Memphis in May. Uh, hopefully even better since I have uh, done some experiments. But um, with that consistency, you've got to have a little luck. You know, you've got to you've got to land on the right table. You've got to get some, you know, uh, judges that uh, come in that, that like your food and like your flavor profile. So, uh, yeah, every team's got to have a little luck, but you can't win Memphis in May without fantastic product. Chris Lilly joining me here on the show. How many times, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I would anticipate an answer. How many times over the past 24 months have you thought about number five? Um, zero. Zero times? To be totally honest. Really? Zero times. I uh, haven't. It, I mean, you know, I've got plenty of other stuff to keep my <laughs> keep my mind busy than to worry about Memphis and May and and trying to get another championship or anything. It'll just happen if it happens. If it doesn't, I'm perfectly content with uh, with with just four, without a doubt. I've had great luck at Memphis and May, and um, contest and the people have treated me right there. So if if four is the number, four is the number. Uh, wow, I'd like to get five. I'd love to get six, but <laughs> uh, but it's definitely not something that I think about a whole lot. Chris, you had mentioned that you're going to be using a Smithfield Duroc pork for the upcoming weekend. Smithfield in itself has really made a splash into the competition world over the last, uh, let's say, year and a half, two years with their products, and they have varying labels or uh, product offerings that they have. I guess for me, it's a little refreshing to see people on the competition circuit looking at stuff that they can just go ahead and get at a Walmart or at a grocery store instead of kind of continuing this increase in competition cost with some of these other products. No, you know, I totally agree. I totally agree. There's some fantastic products out there, and, and uh, definitely the Smithfield uh, Smithfield product is is one of those products. But just like you said, I was at Sam's Club just about two, no, three days ago, uh, Sam's Club in Huntsville, Alabama, and I picked up a, uh, a case and a half. Well, I, I did a whole case, and then I did three uh, three packs of the Smithfield Reserve Prime um, uh, loin back ribs that I'm carrying to Memphis to cook as well, not for the contest, but for uh, for people that are coming over. So yeah, I can go to Sam's Club and get some fantastic pork that I can use in contest and, and are comfortable enough to, you know, cook for, you know, the VIPs and the people that come over and I can, you know, take to a KCBS or a Memphis and Man use. So yeah, there's, a, there's some great options out there and um and 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 you're right you know some of the some of the options out there are high dollar and there's some fantastic you know pork heritage pork out there that is really really good but you know if it, the more options that i have to choose from the better off i'll be and 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 the rest of the competition cooks so competition is good options are great pitmaster of big bob gibson's is chris lilly he is a four-time grand champ might be getting number five this weekend. We'll see how it unfolds, uh, undoubtedly, but uh, we wish you nothing but the best, Chris, and always appreciate the time you give to the show. Thanks so much. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, don't hesitate to call me again. Enjoy the show. All right, Greg, appreciate thank it. You, a lot. you got it. That is Chris Lilly right there. That's right. All you know guests it. on the Barbecue Central show appear via the Smithfield Hotline. Yummy. And there is a four-time champion using Smithfield pork. Uh, so it's not like these guys are saying one thing and using another. At least that guy. I guess I can't speak for everybody. I don't know what you people are doing out there. But he's confident that it, I didn't even know that Smithfield had a, Dur uh, a, a Duroc label. Whoa. Where do you get that at? It's probably in the special part of the store. All right, that's Chris Lilly, Barbecue Hall of Famer, if you need him. All right, folks, if you didn't know already, Big Papa Smokers, the one-stop online shop for anyone interested in barbecue, featuring a comprehensive selection of American-made grills, spices, sauces, accessories, even a kit that gives you everything you need to make a world-class smoker out of a 55-gallon drum. Big Papa Smokers has made a name for itself by making an award-winning line of championship rubs. Their rubs have won almost every major competition barbecue event, period. BPS has also banded together 
with Kello, uh, fellow California-based rub company Simply Marvelous Barbecue to form what has now become known as the West Coast Offense. To find conventional wisdom, these two California-based rub makers have cornered the market on competitive barbecue and begun to redefine the flavor profile that competitive cooks from across the country have begun to aim for. They've even created two of their own unique competitions, the King of the Smoker, which brings the best of the best in barbecue head-to-head -head in a back-to-basics competition. King of the Smoker is unique in the fact that contestants may not use any electric devices, such as pellet cookers or pit miners. Contestants just allowed to use charcoal wood in their wits to win one of the most high-stakes barbecue events around. The other option is a guinea pig event, that's right, a cost-controlled competition that helps bring in newcomers to the competitive barbecue world. It also features prize distribution all the way down to 10th place in each category. This helps provide incentive to get new competitors into the world of barbecue and keep the savvy veterans. On top of all of that, they've created their unique brand ambassador program called the BPS Elite Team, featuring 15 of the best competition teams in the country, working together to promote camaraderie, competition, barbecue, and to benefit children's charities across the U.S. Keep in mind, they've been able to do all this with like six or seven years of being in business. Turning the competition barbecue world on its head, creating their own unique competitions, becoming a staple of a nationwide restaurant chain, and benefiting children's charities across the U.S. Go to BigPapaSmokers.com right now. That's BigPapaSmokers.com. We are back right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Big name interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs, and the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue. It's the Barbecue Central Show. All right, welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. Visit CookinPellets.com for more information or purchase. You can also check them out at Amazon.com. Amazon. Cooking Pellets also has their own app. If you go to the website, you can get the link, download to your iPhone or Android device. It will alert you when great shipping deals are going on, when new products come out, all that good stuff. It is free, and I think the only pellet producer out there that has its own app. Again, cookingpellets.com or Amazon. Amazon. Thanks again to Chris Lilly for joining me this past segment. And that is a 2016 Barbecue Hall of Famer. Hasn't, hasn't thought about number five. Zero times in the last two years. Last year, if you recall, Myron Mixon from Jack's Old South took down his fourth overall, tying him with Chris before that. Chris was the leading grand champion overall in Memphis and May history. Melissa Cookston has three. She's coming up at 1035 this evening. We'll talk to her about that. She's got a great story that we're going to be talking about that I just found on the interwebs, so it has to be true. But it was an interview with her, so it's true. About the hog that she's used, so interesting. Competitive means competitive edge. Competitor. Stuff like that. Also, back in the first hour, we talked with... Max Good from AmazingRibs.com about the Traeger Timberline. If you missed either of those segments, get the podcast, sign up for it, go to the BBQCentralShow.com, and then click on any one of those posts, and uh, down there you can get the podcast feed, subscribe through iTunes. There may or may not be an app in development for this here show to be released within a week or so, maybe. Bigger news, zero dollars to download. Zero. Thinking about it right now, it would have access to the live feed, so you could always tune into the show on Tuesdays, and then you could get archived shows throughout the rest of the week. A little bit of information on the show, you get to visit the sponsors, home button, about, all that good stuff. But basically, an easier way for you to take your phone with you and hear the show wherever you are. You don't have to watch me. You don't. But you, you need to hear me. I got important stuff to say. So I'll keep you updated through the social media channels on when the Barbecue Central app is going to drop in the Google Play Store and in the iTunes App Store. 
All right, well, we'll take a quick break here and reload for the second hour. You want to jump in? I'm more than happy to have you. You are listening and watching the Barbecue Central show right here on the Barbecue Central Networks. Stick around. We'll be right back. This is Jimmy Burns from Melbourne, Ohio, and you're listening to Barbecue Central. Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine, I just want. You have a great show, I'm a big fan. Boing. So what 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 seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead and he's in the in the crackle. Charbono! It's all about the Charbono, dude! Succulent fish! What? We ate fifty four wiener. So is the liberty of shit feast. I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seed. <laughs> we have soft men working on it right now. All right, just like that, we are into the second hour. hey Congratulations, associates. You have found the Barbecue Central Show. This is a show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling. We do it live each and every Tuesday from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio. It is the barbecue capital of the North Coast. And I am Greg Rempe, your host. If you missed the first hour, we missed you. We really did. I especially missed you and you. Maybe not that guy. I kid. Never fear. As I said on the way out of the first hour, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or Google Play or a number of other podcast directories, whatever your favorite app is. And then at 11.55 tonight, starting at 11.55, the show will be distributed through those podcast feeds and you will wake up bright and early on a hump day with the barbecue central show ready to get you over that hump pointed to the weekend once again it is a memphis in may weekend to be had coming up so we're looking forward to seeing who ends up taking that crown down this weekend a lot of people on the ground for this show whether they know it or not they're going to be able to give their input and takes on it next week whether that be pre-recorded or not we'll see but very much looking forward to this coming weekend and what happens out in Memphis in May. By the way, breaking news, there is not a Darren Worth sighting. Andrew, you are not the fuck. Right. So it is not going to be Darren Worth's year to take down the last and final jewel of whatever barbecue crown he would wear and or make himself. Because he would have won it all at that point. You win, he wins Memphis in May, he's won them all, period. All the majors, he's won. All right, still to come on the show tonight, coming up in about 12 minutes from now, Joe Heitzberg from Crowd Cow. That's going to be a fun conversation. And we will close out the show with three time Memphis in May champ, Melissa Cookston, Yazoo's Delta Q, obviously uh, owner of Memphis Barbecue Company. And then that other restaurant, Steak. Two of my favorite things, barbecue and steak. I love it. I don't know how much time we're going to have to talk about that. That probably could be a whole other segment all on her own. She didn't know she, after a couple year hiatus, she's going to be coming back on the show on the regular. She didn't even know. It. Alert, Melissa. Alert. Run now if you want to. All right. The National Pro Barbecue Tour presented by Sam's Club rolled into Bowling Green, Kentucky this past weekend. This was the local qualifier that sends the top six teams into the Bartlett, Tennessee regional final. That takes place on July 1st. And not to digress too much here, Bowling Green, Kentucky, and I can't get one in anywhere, Ohio? What? Come on, Sam's Club. Put one back in Ohio. And might I recommend something in Cleveland, locally here in Cleveland. I'll cover it free of charge. I'll bring my little handy-dandy recorder down there, get top-notch audio and video. I might even 
hire uh, Sam the Cooking Guy's son to come in and shoot video. It'll be fabulous. We'll talk about it. It's only high dollar. Anyway, the top six teams moving on to Bartlett, Tennessee, July 1st for that regional final are as follows. And in particular order, Grand Champion with a 701.7. Scuffle Town Smokers. And literally half points or less away from tying or being a Grand Champ all on his own. The reserve grand champ with a 701.68, so 701.72 and a 701.68. Wow. What is that? Four hundredths? Five hundredths of a point? Differentiating the two, that's as close as it gets almost. I've seen them closer than that going out to like the thousandths point and ten thousandths point. But... 725 and 680, very close. Anyway, reserve grand champ, Gillies Barbecue. Third place, former KCBS team of the year, Warren County Pork Choppers, Donnie Gray, uh, Gray, Donnie Bray and the gang out there. Number four, under the radar barbecue with a 694.22. By the way, Warren County Pork Choppers, 694.78. So here's another half point or less, separating three and four. Number five, Contagious Q with a 691.9 and rounding out the top six and moving on to the regional final. Bring in the Heat Barbecue with a 690.2, so about 11 points separating one and six, but one and two very close, three and four very close. Even five and six, you got about a point separating those two. So a very tight one through six, very competitive top six. The next National Pro Barbecue Tour event presented by Sam's Club taking place this coming weekend. And one of my favorite cities in the world, Marietta, Georgia. I love Marietta. That place is great. Wonderful weather. Kind of a dirty south situation going on there. Great architecture. There is one specific reason why I detest uh -oh. Marietta, Georgia, but I'm not talking about it. I won't talk about it. 2017 horse meat update. How about this? A barbecue central show exclusive horse meat. news update. I don't know if you guys had seen this in the news or not, but I believe a week ago Monday, there was a restaurant in Pittsburgh called Cure that hosted a, I don't know, it was like invite slash pop up. So the owner of restaurant, Cure, Justin Severino, had a one night where two chefs came down from, I believe, the Ontario, Canada area, and they were serving a menu, special menu for one night that was representative of the region of the country that they came for. And one of the things on the menu, excuse me, one of the things on the menu, an appetizer, La Cheval. Uh oh uh oh La Cheval, of course. Uh, Cheval is the French term for horse, I believe. I've seen Cheval before in the French culture. It was horse tartare with salt and vinegar chips, I believe, black pepper, probably like cake together, some type of an egg on top. Kind of like steak tartare, but horse tartare. Representative. They do it is one hundred percent legal. To eat horse in Canada, of course, that's where the difference lies here, though, right? Uh, nobody is pro horse meat 2017 than me. For crying out loud, it's my platform on this show. I've talked to top men in top governmental agencies. I've been in contact with FSIS. I know everything there is to know about horse meat legalities in this country. So when I called somebody, I think it was Doug Durda that hit me to the fact that there was a place in Pittsburgh, hit me on Twitter saying that, hey, did you see this? I thought it was a real menu, like permanent menu. I immediately dialed the phone number, talked to the house manager. I was like, hey, I'm calling about the Cheval thing on the menu. She's like, yeah. I'm like, how are you getting away with this? I hate to make it sound like they were committing a crime, but I mean, I guess 
for all points and intents, they were committing a crime. It is illegal to eat horse meat in this country. Uh, whether you have brought it from a sustaining farm, a, a sustainable farm in Canada, where you are breeding those horses to be eaten, still doesn't make it legal for the dudes in Canada to bring it in to America and surf. In order for it to be legal, it has to be inspected by FSIS and you get the FDA stamp of approval. Once you get that stamp, it can be put out into the market for consumption here in this country. Now, it is completely legal for somebody to raise horses, pay for the FDA to come in, go through their anti-mortem inspections, give that FDA stamp of approval, and then put it out. However, it is completely cost prohibitive to do unless you just have endless, endless, endless amounts of money going into a segment that isn't just going to be a dead bang success overnight. That's why people aren't doing it. It is absolutely 100% legal to do it, except you have to pay for everything, and that's why nobody's doing it. So when I asked the house waitress or the house manager, I said, you know, it is illegal. Just because they brought it in from Canada doesn't make it legal. So, and of course, drawing the ire of all the pro horse and horse has butte and horses full of all these antibiotics and fly spray, and this, that, the other thing. Of course, all the horses here do. And not every place in Canada, I would imagine, is raising horses the wrong way for consumption. They're probably doing it the right way. So don't just fall on one side of the cake here, pal. But slowly and surely, the demand for horse meat, whether you know it or not, is getting into this country. So Justin Severino, although on a very wild ride here as of late, he was invited to come on this show. He has uh, politely declined at this point. Overwhelming majority on his Facebook page, not so happy with his decision to serve La Cheval. That's all right. More to come on that story, I'm sure. I heard it about on Cleveland News Channel 3, NBC's affiliate, believe it or not. Folks, if you're looking for a great way to step up the barbecue and grilling game, no easier or better way to do it than by adding all of the Butcher Barbecue products to your arsenal. That's right. Rubs, sauces, injections. One of the best things that you can add right now that will step up the barbecue and grilling game in ways that you will never imagine. And not only the barbecue and grilling game, but your overall cooking game in the kitchen or outside is the grilling oil. You know, the CHOPS Power Injector System is the barbecue tool of the year. This thing should be like barbecue ingredient of the year for the last, how long has it been out, Dave? Five years? Six years? Whatever. It should be getting it each and every year. It's a great product. It's shelf stable. It can sit out there right on the counter. It's not going to go bad. It's not going to get rancid. And like I always say, when it sits out on the table, you can see it. So when you're cooking eggs or you're going to do some grilled cheese, you want some butter flavor on popcorn or whatever, here's the grilling oil. Boom, right out there in front of you. Not out of sight, out of mind like a lot of other products you got to stick in the refrigerator and really remind yourself to use. This stuff is great. It also comes in three flavors. Butter flavor, which is my favorite, chipotle, or chipotle, or however you say it. And steakhouse seasoning. Great on steaks, right? Here's what I like to do. Cook my steak. When I flip it, add a little butcher's grilling oil. And then when I take it off, a little more butcher's barbecue grilling oil right on the top, either steakhouse or butter flavor. Lays the heat right down. Blends in nicely with the meat. Oh so good if you haven't tried the grilling oils i'm telling you right now don't do anything else if you have a birthday coming up tell your girlfriend wife or same-sex lover that you want grilling oil hey by the way as meathead would say no rules in the kitchen or the bedroom take the grilling oil where you see fit butcherbbq.com butcherbbq.com stock up now on all the products and we are back with Joe Heitzberg right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. The only show giving you a monthly visit from a doctor of barbecue, a man actually named Meathead. 
the author of a barbecue bible bloggers reviewers competitors and manufacturers by the dozens it's the barbecue central show once again here's your host greg rempe all right, welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by Unknown Smoker Accessories, purveyors of made in the USA stainless steel barbecue smoker and lid hinges, barbecue accessory hangers, rocket hot chimney grillers, heavy duty aluminum foil dispensers. The fine products from Unknown Smoker Accessories keep your gear where it needs to be at arm's length, ready for battle. You can also buy the hot chimney grillers at bigpapasmokers.com. Partnership is good. Yeah. Of course, you can still buy all the products that Unknown Smoker Accessories has at unknownbbq.com slash shop right today. All right. Hey, what if I told you there was a service out there right now that would allow you to actually buy a portion of a cow, maybe if you're loaded, a whole cow, and then shipped right to you for consumption at your leisure. Interested in learning a little more about it? I can help you with that. Let's go ahead and race to the Smithfield Hotline. And welcome, co-founder of Crowd Cow, Joe Heitzberg, joining me here on the show. Joe, how are you, buddy? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm uh, doing fabulous, Joe, and I really appreciate you making time for the show tonight. So uh, I guess before we get into Crowd Cow and all that good stuff, a little background about yourself uh, personally and professionally before, or maybe if there was something before uh, Crowd Cow, what you did professionally before that. No, I just graduated high school. Yeah, all right. Week. Perfect success. <laughs> You've done it. <laughs> um, I've worked in high tech, you know, for uh, my whole career. Um, and uh, just before this, I was I was starting companies. You know, I've done a bunch of startups. Uh, my co-founder as well, Ethan. Uh, uh, probably the one between us that you may have heard of Urban Spoon that Ethan did. Yep. Um, uh, I was at a, an incubator most recently. Well, in Seattle, it's a very large VC firm, and, and we created some an AI company called Mighty AI and a company called Reply Yes. But, um, but you know, we were just uh, talking about beef one day. Our friend buys a entire cow from a farm every year and brags about how good the beef is. And Ethan's wife's a vegetarian. He's like, man, I'd love to get in on that, but you have to buy like 550 pounds. <laughs> And um, I was like, yeah, that Brendan, he brags about that every year. I want I want that beef too. It's better. It's better for you. It's grass finished. It's dry aged. You know, the farmer, the cows never get transported anywhere or stressed out. It's marbled meat. It's great. I want that. I want to serve that to my kids and I want to eat it. So it was like, but I don't want to buy that much or have a, I don't have a meat freezer. So Ethan was, was like, uh, one day he was like, we should crowdfund a cow and like 50 people can buy it. <laughs> and um, we're like, it's actually a good business idea. <laughs> perhaps so we talked to our friends and they said you know either i'm a vegetarian or yeah i would do that and we went to strangers at a starbucks cafe near where we were uh and excuse me sir do you eat beef <laughs> and uh, and many people said the same thing i'm a vegetarian no i would never do that or yeah what's the url and so we were like well we better get a url we better go buy a cow <laughs> that was uh, nearly two years ago do you uh, meet? So once you, there's obviously a threshold that you and Ethan have to meet for you to think, okay, well now we can go from this level to this level and this level to this level. At what point do you have to realize that maybe you're not an expert in sourcing ranchers? And once you get to that point to be able to provide the beef, I mean that's kind of really important, right? Well, you you have to figure it out because you have no money when you first start a business. And so you can't pay anybody, so you got to figure it out yourself. I remember the first time, you know, we went to like, we just started like, where do you find good farms? We want to get a good one, <laughs> you know, go to Google like you always do. And we found some names. We started placing phone calls. And the first thing we realized is that a lot of farms don't answer their phone. You know, the, I, I, we kept hearing this, this voice mailbox has not been set up. <laughs> so we got in our car and we drove and we knocked on doors. And wow. I remember, you know, in the first, the first rancher we ever spoke to, we were like, hi, uh, we'd like to buy a cow. And she was like, are you sure you want to buy a cow? Do you mean a steer? Cows are for milk. Yeah. You don't eat them. And we we're like, okay, we've got a lot to learn in this, uh, in this business. Uh, and we were, you know, it was very embarrassing at first, but you know, at this point, I think, especially in our community and the West coast, uh, most of the independent farms, the ones that we work with that are family owned 
independent farms dedicated to building great quality products that are very constrained in how they can sell it to their local market because of the logistics. They've heard of us by now. And so we're getting, you know, at this point, you know, the ranches are coming to us and we're, we're getting to filter through to the, the ones we think would be most exciting for our customers. And so we have learned a lot. I would, I would say I have walked many a cow pasture and <laughs> met lots of farms and had lots of great meals with, with farmers. And we've gotten to know the whole, a lot more than I ever thought I would know about that world. Joe Heitzberg joining me here on the show, co-founder of Crowd Cow, the website, by the way, if you want to check it out here while we're chatting it up, crowdcow.com, intuitive enough. Uh, so talk to me, Joe, kind of high level about Crowd Cow and what people can expect if they want sure. to take part in it. How do you go about it? Yeah. So what we do is we, on our website, feature a ranch one at a time where we'll say, here's this ranch, here's how they do it, here's the history, and here's all of the beef of a single animal that's for sale. And we put all the shares up. You can pick and choose the exact cuts you want down to the ounce. So if you're interested in only um, the brisket point, you can get that. Um, if you want bones, it makes broth. If you want heart, tongue, and liver or New York steaks, you can get whatever you want. We've got some nice mix packs for the value. And uh, we say when enough of them have been claimed, we say the cow tips and everyone becomes a stakeholder. I'll go get something. Hey, uh, this is our T-shirt. I don't know if you can see that. Stakeholder. Oh, got it. Love it. It's funny, <laughs> but it, it's crowdfunding a cow. You're literally a part owner at that point in a single animal. And then we're working with the farmer and the local community in terms of the processing to get that uh, cut up and and uh, and shipped out. And it comes to your door in a box uh, with, you know, it's an insulated box. Is there a time frame between when I buy my shares of the crowd, uh, <laughs> the cow, and it yeah. tips? When do I get to expect, or is there a, uh, some type of a contract between tipping and when the stakeholders will get the meat? Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's we're not charging the credit cards unless everything's sold and it's tipped, but we always do. And we've also, at this scale we're at now, working with the farms, have got a, a cycle going with each ranch. So when you go in and tip a cow, it'll ship out the following Monday. So if you tip a cow on a Thursday, it's going to be delivered. It's going to hit the trucks on a on a monday and you usually get it within one to three days depending on where you live um and so uh we've but we've dry aged that for two weeks minimum um so we're working with the farmer and their natural what they've got in terms of uh readiness um so that they always have something to sell and we're always selling something and we're always processing it ahead of time so that you know you get everything nicely packaged and dry aged but you get it quickly so you can go on the website, you see the uh, the cows that are available, the, the cuts that are available, you can buy what you want. Do you have any choice aside from the cuts? You know, I'm a, a guy that likes a, a thick steak, inch and a half, mm -hmm. maybe inch and three quarters. Can you specify thickness or is that up to the butchery? Uh, we have a cut plan and we vary that seasonally depending on what's going on. So we're doing three and four bone rib roasts at, uh, in the, during the holidays and for special occasions. We've done you know, 100% purebred Wagyu, and we'll do special things around different types of beef. Um, but generally, we definitely offer some thick cut um, rib steaks in every in every event we do. And, and but the typical is like an inch, an inch thick, you know, something a little easier to cook for most people. Joe Heitzberg talking to me about crowdcow.com. Joe, what about these ranchers? You said you went to Google, you started driving, mm -hmm. in essence, cold calling ranchers. What kind yeah. of a criteria does Crowd Cow have that ranchers have to meet? And I would imagine when you're out there, ranchers are kind of interviewing too. And, and what kind of feedback yeah. are you getting from them? The number one thing we're, we're trying to get is the best quality in terms of taste. So that's marble and consistency throughout the year. And two is that you know, we're looking for independent ranches that own the whole process. So most of the beef that you'll find at the grocery store or even online will be from what I would call like a factory farming or industrial beef world. It's box beef, We're not selling the whole animals. It's at an industrial scale. It's producers that are, are producing calves and they're going to auction and then they're going on trucks. They're getting aggregated into concentrated feedlots. They're getting slaughtered in mass and it's being sold price per pound in a grocery store. What we're saying is like, hey, uh, we look for ranches where it's all in one ranch the entire life. Um, so it's birth to the end on one ranch. And that means the animals have been cared for the whole time by one or two people um, eating the same grass and only grass primarily for the entire life. 
within that same climate. So if you taste that beef, it might be slightly different than a beef from another area. Um, and then we're also looking for genetics. So not ranches that are buying animals from that same calf operation I was pointing to before, but who've actually developed their herd for their unique genetics. So if it's black Angus and it's been in their family for multiple generations and they've been breeding it for natural immunity to disease and for marbling, that we're looking for stories like that and situations where you know it's going to end up as a higher quality meat. Um, the second thing and a lot is no antibiotics and and no uh, growth hormones ever. So um, it, what we found is you know when you're in a, a good natural environment, you're taking care of the animals, um, and it's not run by a corporation doesn't care. It's run by people who've done it their whole lives. Um, you don't need antibiotics and you don't need growth hormones, right? Um, that healthy environment, healthy animals, healthy food, healthy beef doesn't require all that stuff. So we look for that as well. Do you have a, like a, a checklist or a uh, watchdog on these ranchers? Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that inherently people will try and get away with whatever they can get away with for maximum profit. but uh, or, or is it just a, a trust thing that you sit down with these uh, ranchers and they sit down with you and everybody agrees that this is the way we're going to do it and we're going to do it like that? It's a combination of those two things, both. Both are important. I mean, we've got, at this point, about a dozen ranches, so that's not a lot to manage. We're not we're not open marketplace for just any old ranch and, you know, lay it out there. But uh, so we're, we're at a, a close relationship, you know. it's. I mean, you have to be on the phone with them all the time. You have to be giving them feedback. One of the things we're providing the ranches is that feedback. They know where the beef is going. They know how the customers are enjoying it, um, and they know what it looks like when it's – hanging and dry aging, and they want that feedback so they can do their job better too. Um, so closing that whole loop and making it connected for them is really valuable. So they they want to be uh, really connected to us and really um, in, in uh, communicating with us about that all, all the time. Joe, you'd mentioned grass a few different times here during the interview. Is it kind of a, a, a mission of Crowd Cow to be grass-fed beef or i mean I, you know personally i'm more of a grain guy myself yeah. just because I, I like that flavor but is, is are you guys yeah. more of a grass uh, company i guess i love grain finished beef too personally i love it um what we are all about is transparency and selection of right we're saying like when you're in the grocery store and you're walking down the wine aisle you've got every different variety different parts of the world every price point you hit the meat counter what do you have price per pound and you get a sticker if it's grass or not. Well, we're saying, we're not like, we're the grass sticker guys. We're, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's a wonderful world of beef worth, worth exploring. Between the genetics, the varieties, the natural environments that come from, the story of the ranch, all these things are really fun. And you're spending more on the steaks at your dinner party than you are on the wine anyways. You deserve to know more. And it does taste better when it's coming from these places where they've been when done well and they've bred for marbling and so forth. So, um, you know, I'll say this, like any cow in a field can be called grass fed. That doesn't mean it's going to taste good. So we look for, like I said, independent ranches that have that happens to correspond to, you know, an independent ranch that keeps tight control of the whole process for the whole period tends to correspond to grass fed, grass finished. But and that's been over 90 percent of the beef we have. We always sell it exactly listing what it is. But this week, actually, for our West Coast customers, we launched our first, um, actually our second grass-fed grain-finished beef, you know, and it's a fifth generation farm. So they've been doing this, think about that, five generations. Yep. I can't even, is that great, great, great grandparents? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Same family, same name on the beef, uh, same herd, black Angus. Um, they grow the grain on the ranch and they're in a dry part of our state in Washington on the Eastern side. They don't grow grass all year. You couldn't do grass-finished beef. It wouldn't make sense. Why, why would you truck grass in? It doesn't make sense. They're growing it on their thing. And then they're using the manure to fertilize their other crops. They have apples and cherries. It's a beautiful story. It's sustainable. It's wonderful. It's delicious beef and it's grain finished. But what, what it is also is an alternative to the mystery meat of you don't know where that grain finished really came from. And uh, you may be concerned about you know, how it got. One of the biggest tags on millennials is the constant thirst of information and if you look at how people are buying and where consumer confidence is and willingness to pay, you look at the millennial generation and they are, I want to know where my beef came from, when it was born, what it was finished on, how they mm -hmm. culled it, how it was processed. I mean, they are 
they. I'm like 50 years old or whatever. But, uh, I mean, there does seem to be, with that generation and, and following it, uh, more of a requirement that they know what they're putting in their bodies. And this almost seems like a perfect fit for that particular niche. I think so. And I think the experience, too. I, I mean, I, I really think what we're doing is is the way that all beef would be sold if the Internet had been here 100 years ago. You know, it gets trucked around, it gets on a store shelf and has a label because that's all you have room for. And that's the only way you can get it to people as a perishable. That was the most efficient way before the Internet. I think this generation and all of us, if you make it easy and convenient and create that direct connection and transparency, everyone would do that if the price is right and it's convenient. I mean, why wouldn't you? Like, I wouldn't have to find my – you've seen that episode of Portlandia, that TV show where they're in the restaurant and they say uh, – what kind of chicken was it? And how was that chicken raised? And can we go visit the chicken farm before we order it? And they go and visit the chicken farm. And come. <laughs> That's funny because it's true. It's, we all kind of want that at some level. And you can make fun of it. But if you make that kind of transparency easy and priced right, why would you not choose that? It, it's better. And so and the other thing is millennials, I think, want especially as experiences too. You know, I envision um, – uh, and we're just we're just starting to dabble in this, but I'd like to see the rancher out on horseback doing the um, the roundup. You know why not? That's the beef I'm serving this weekend, and we can all enjoy it and tell a story. And I can go click to the Snapchat story and go view. You know, I think those kinds of things are fun. No membership required here, right? You just start an account and then start buying the the pieces of meat that you want. Yep, that's correct. We don't force a membership or a subscription. It's we make it easy to reorder when you want to. Um, we make it you're in control of exactly the cuts you want and you know exactly what kind of beef you're getting and how it was raised and who raised it and and it's going to be good beef is there any type of a guarantee on the off chance that i buy my t-bones and i don't for whatever reason i don't feel that they're the quality that i was expecting is there like a, a return policy or a refund or anything like that uh, we don't state like a return policy, but we if, if somebody's, you know, not getting what we promised or is severely disappointed or anything went wrong along the delivery, we're, we're refunding or crediting towards future orders, um, as the case may be. But I would say on the whole, like uh, we find when people discover us, try it, they're they're hooked and they stick around. Yeah. Here's where we are. What are we like two and a half, three years in since initial about, conception, something like that? Between a year and a half and two years in. Okay. Yeah. I hate to be like big picture five year down the road guy, but you know, a year yeah. from now uh, or a year and a half from now, so double the amount of time that we're at now. What yeah. what like what would you like to see Crowd Cow at? Well, right now we're only shipping in the West Coast, and within 30 days we're shipping to every state in the lower 48. So that's a big one that's on my mind. And um, we're only doing beef. I could see a year from now we're doing salmon or pork. Um, and, you know, we've got an audience that, that loves us and comes back for more and they're asking for those things all the time. So, you know, I met a, I met a guy, we, we have pork farmers all the time saying, when can I work with you? Um, and then and pork is one of those meats where, you know, a good heritage porker that's done right in this way, so much better than oh, store yeah, bought. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, so we're really excited about that. I met a guy who wall street dropout and he bought a big fi salmon fishing boat and he called us and he said, I've got five days per year, the first five day far offshore king salmon run, <laughs> and I'm getting equipment that I can flay and flash freeze those king salmon on my boat. And I'm like finishing his sentence, and I'm going to put a video on our site, <laughs> tell your story, and let people place orders while you're out there those five days. And when you get back, it's all sold, yep. and we'll get it shipped direct. And that, you know, this is, I'm in Seattle, Salmon Central, and they put orange food coloring in the salmon on the label. It's like, why? It doesn't have to be that way. There's a better way. So I'm really excited that, you know, a year or two from now, I think we'll be doing all those things and more, hopefully, knock on wood. Um, but, you know, it's one foot after the other for the, for the time being. And we're going to grow as slow as we have to to keep the quality high in terms of who we work with on the ranch side and keeping the customers happy. And that's our strategy. Joe Heitzberg is the co-founder of CrowdCow, the website crowdcow.com. If you're interested in becoming a stakeholder, get over there, check it out, and see what's happening. Joe, really appreciate the time tonight, man. Thanks so much for coming up. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. You got it. There he is. Uh -huh. Joe Heitzberg. 
All guests on the Barbecue Central Show appear via the Smithfield Hotline. Crowd cow. Yummy. Yeah, let's do crowd cow. Somebody go to the website and see what what's uh, being offered right now. Let's let's all tip a cow, as they say. Is that what they say? That's Joe Heitzberg, co-founder of CrowdCow, CrowdCow.com. Let me talk to you quickly about the longest-running sponsor of the show, located in Warminster, Pennsylvania, the Barbecue Guru Gang. If you've been thinking about automatic pit temperature control devices, stop here. This is the company that started it all. They created this technology. Don't buy from anybody else. Start here. If you're not familiar with how they work, Imagine a product that once your pit temperature is set, keeps it running at that temperature all the way through the cook. Maybe you are a busy working pro like me, or you're constantly on the run with kids in the weekends like me. And quite frankly, you just don't have the time to set around and tend pit temperatures. I get it. The guru allows you to throw on a pork butt, a brisket, a couple slabs of ribs or all of that. And off you go to do whatever it is you need to get done. The guru maintains that pit temperature you set it at. A lot of different models to choose from, so make sure you pick the one that's right for you. If you are looking for a cooker, by the way, to house one of these automatic pit temperature control devices, the shotgun oven is something you're going to want to take a look at. Really built well, holds a ton of meat, revamped look from the old Onyx oven. Do yourself a favor, head on over to bbqguru.com and check out their products. If you do have any questions, don't guess, call them. 800-288-GURU. They will make sure you're outfitted with exactly what you need to get you up and running right out of the box. Again, 800-288-GURU or thebbqguru.com. Melissa Cookston coming up out of the break. Stick around. We'll be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. The biggest name in pork is bringing you great opportunities this barbecue season. Get smoking with Smithfield and their Committed Cooks program. You can learn more at the website, Smokin, S-M-O-K-I-N, SmokinWithSmithfield.com. My last guest tonight, a three-time overall grand champ at Memphis and May World Barbecue Championship. Her most recent GC came back in 2012. She's also a very successful book author and, of course, restaurant owner. Let's go ahead and race to the Smithfield hotline and welcome back Melissa Cookston to the show. Hi, Melissa. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Oh, absolutely fabulous. It's been a hot minute. How are you? I'm well. It's um, good to hear from you. Well, I'm glad you made time for the show. I know we have kind of that busy weekend uh, coming up here, that being Memphis in May. So uh, I guess kind of let, let's get right to it as we look ahead to this coming weekend. Certainly an event you're used to going to. You've done a number of times. Certainly an event you're used to winning as well. What are your high level? Think, what? You don't. What you? I don't think you ever get used to winning it. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, not used to, but I mean, you certainly won it, no doubt about it. So you know, just from a high level, as you look going into the weekend, uh, I'm sure you're probably going to start loading in here over the next day or so. Um, how do you explain Memphis and May to people that maybe? aren't familiar with it or might just be getting into barbecue or might be heading down to Memphis this weekend for something to do? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's like a festival, like no other it's, you know, it, the tents are huge. Um, you know, they, uh, the teams really get into, um, you know, putting on a show for people. We, um, we do on-site presentations, so it's, it's very nicely set up. Um, you know the the booths are very big. Um, a lot of parties going on. Um, it's it's very aesthetically pleasing. I'll say that. Chris Lilly was on last hour, and he had mentioned that you know if you go to a lot of other competitions, it's a little more closed door. The public really isn't uh, welcomed or allowed around a lot of stuff. And this is kind of the exact opposite, as you had uh, just mentioned. So. You know, if, if you want to get exposed to some style of competition barbecue, this might be like that best opportunity for you then. 
I agree with that. Uh, Melissa Cookson joining me here on the show, pitmaster of Yazoo's Delta Q. One of the things that I was reading, Melissa, that I thought was very interesting is this pig that you're going to be cooking, this hog that you're going to be cooking this coming weekend. This is something that you've kind of engineered yourself, uh, if that's the right term, or it's kind of this hybrid pig project. Is that correct? That's correct. I've been working on it um, three years. So talk to me about how you are doing that. I mean, obviously nothing trademark uh, project secret, but I guess I don't know if I've ever talked to a pit master who has actually had that much hands-on to something that they're actually going to be cooking and then giving to the judges uh, for evaluation at a barbecue contest. Yeah, I don't know if anybody's ever been crazy enough to do this before. Um, <laughs> in, in 2014, um, you know, I I cooked what I thought was the best hog I had ever cooked at Memphis in May. So, you know, it got me to thinking, well, how can I do better? Um, and, you know, uh, we we back in the day, and, and I've been cooking competitions for 20 years now, you know, you just kind of check a box, okay? I'll have a 180-pound hog. And you really don't know anything about the hog, especially back then. Um, you know, it was just a commodity hog that you ordered. Um, so, um, you know, several years ago, I guess five or six years ago, then we were able to get, you know, um, maybe a heritage breed hog. So I've been cooking uh, Berkshire hogs um, for the last, I guess, five or six years, um, Berkshire hogs from Newman Farms. So I was really excited about that, and I've done really well with them. So um, in 2014, um, I won the whole hog category at Memphis May, and, and it was the best hog I'd ever cooked. Um, but it got me to thinking, okay, so there's got to be better. But, you know, there's really no place that you can order anything better. So um, I really started studying the genetics of hogs. And, you know, with, with cooking whole hog, you have a little bitty loin and you have medium-sized shoulders. You have huge hands. And you know, fat content plays a big part in being able to cook the whole car carcass at one time. So, you know, and looking at the genetics of hog, I knew I needed higher fat content. So, um, you know, what breed of hog would bring that to the table? Love the texture of Berkshire hog. Um, so I've, I've brought another breed to the table. So I thought, well, I'll cross these breeds. And um, so, you know, it was a rare breed. And finding that was not easy um so i kind of locate located this other breed of hog um and um so then it became okay the diet that you feed this hog because um you know diet plays an important role not only in texture but in flavor so i started researching all the different diets and and i'm a grain fed person i really like the the flavor that the grains give give meat mm -hmm. so um you know, I started looking at corn and oats and, and proteins, and um, I kind of wanted to, to play with some molasses in there and create a sweet feed, if you will, because I, I grew up around horses, and, and, and um, you know, my great-grandparents slaughtered hogs, and um, so I, I knew a little bit about, about feed, but, you know, not enough um, when it came to actual, um, you know, so I, I got a little bit of help. Um, so then I, I really, I didn't really want to put them in my backyard, and it just so happened that um, a farmer, not, you know, an hour or so from my house, um, hit me up on Facebook, and he said, you know what, I'm raising hogs, and would you be interested in, in cooking one of my hogs? And I said, well, not really, but would you be interested in raising some of mine? <laughs> and he said, well, what are you doing? And, and I think he thought I was crazy, um, and, and I probably am. But um, but I met him and his wife, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this this just seems like you know perfect. So, um, so I I kind of got him to buy into the idea a little bit, and and it just kind of happened from there. Um, but it's been a lot of fun, and it, it's been pretty exciting. And in theory, and on paper, and in my head, it all worked, but I I really wasn't sure. Um, but we had a litter of piglets, and. I got one up to 200 pounds and, and I cooked it. Um, and oh my gosh, it was, it worked. It, it, what I thought, the, theor the theoretical hog, it worked. And um, so I'm so excited and nervous at the same time to be cooking these hogs at Memphis and May. When you cook that first hog and you are experiencing what your hope was or what your, your expectation is, is being met and, and perhaps 
surpass because I can hear the excitement in your voice. Like visually, I mean, did it look different? Was it was the meat texture different? Did it feel more tender? I mean, this is all stuff that you know from the inexperienced person like me doesn't really know a lot of this stuff. So, I mean, was it palatable and visually different? Well, I'll tell you, you know, I, I cook my hogs running style and I do a, a, what I call a bikini coat, which means I skin my hog because I want to, um, I want to be able to access certain points of the meat. We're judged on ham, shoulder, and loin. And so I access certain points on those three cuts in order to be able to inject and get rub in there because I want to, I want to get flavor to those parts. And so when I first started that skinning process over the the shoulders uh pulled back um that skin off that shoulder and it was a probably three inch layer of just creamy white fat that um is it had it had no smell and it was it was white as snowflakes and um I knew right then that I had done what I intended to do. And, and I will tell you that I was dancing around my kitchen and my staff thought I had lost my mind. <laughs> they said, Melissa has finally gone batshit crazy, um, which they had probably thought that already. But um, I, I knew then that, that you know, it, it, I had done what I intended to do. So at that point, it was like, okay, what does the meat look like? So... Um, when I finally got to the meat, you know, you're, you're worried at that point is, okay, is there enough meat here to cook? Um, but when I got to the shoulder, I realized the intramuscular fat was, was good as well. Um, and the shoulders were, the meat was, you know, it, it was exactly what I wanted it to be. The shoulders were nice and big. Um, you know, I cook big hogs. I cook 200 pound hogs. So, um, you know, it, it was, it was spot on. And, you know, for me, of course, I had a plan B because you know me. I'm always going to have a plan B. Of course. Um, I had I had purebred Berkshires <laughs> as a backup just in case this didn't work. Um, but, you know, I, I cooked that hog, and the loins were so juicy, um, you know, because the loin is, is so easily overcooked because they're mm. so small. On these hogs, on this hog, when I cooked it, I called him practice. I named him practice. Um, you know, it in the shoulders and, and, and the hams both, I mean, the, the texture of the meat, and I'm, I don't know if it was the crossbreed or what we fed it, and it doesn't really matter to me, you know, at this point. Um, the texture of the meat was better than, than the purebred Berkshire. Um, the, the coloring was a, a, a little bit redder um, in the raw state, but it cooked up that nice white, um, you know, what, what you're used to with a whole hog. Um, but, but it turned out perfect. I mean, it, it was better than, than what I thought it would be. So what a nice surprise that was. When you look ahead to this weekend and obviously you said, you know, a, you're, you're never used to winning it. And, uh, I don't, I don't know if you go in expecting to win, you want to win, of course, but expecting to win might be another thing. Do you think that, uh, this hog creation is giving you the single best shot at attaining yet another grand championship? You know, Memphis and May, you, Memphis and May, I will go in giving it all I have, but I will tell you, you have to have a perfect product at Memphis and May, but you also have to have a lot of luck. Um, you know, you go into a blind table with another good hog sample and both of you get knocked out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you go on site with two other good hog teams and you get knocked out of finals. So, you know, it, it, it all is in the draw of the judges you get. Um, so you can have a perfect hog and get knocked out. I will tell you that if we don't make finals, it won't be the hog's fault. It'll be that <laughs> I screwed it up or I just got a bad lineup. <laughs> it won't be the hog's fault. It'll be my fault or it'll just be a bad draw. So um, there's a lot of luck involved. You know, there are so many good teams down there. Um, and it, you know, it's just the luck of the draw where you land on the blind tables and, you know, and, and who you draw on site. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's how you land and, and what judges you get, you know, they, they, 
they got to like your your flavor profile, and and you got to land on a good blind table. If this weekend bears a grand championship, you join very illustrious company uh, with two Hall of Famers, Myra Mixon, and uh, Chris Lilly, both with four underneath their belt. Would that would that be the best grand championship at Memphis and May that you could get, or is the first one always the most special? Oh, they're all special. Um, you know, every one, the first one I won, it was like, things like this don't happen to people like me. Um, the second one I won, they, they had to show me back to my booth. I, I could not believe that had happened. I really, I didn't know which way to go. Um, you, you know, every time is like the first time it's, it's, um, it, things like that just don't happen. I mean, it's just, it's a dog fight. Every, every year is like a dog bite, um, you know, and and I will tell you, you know, just making finals, just just getting to the final round is is so difficult. And then going through the final round is so difficult. Um, so, you know, you never go in with any expectation. You know, you, you go and, and you, you give it the best you've got and, and you keep your fingers crossed, but you I never, never have any expectation. Of making finals even. Melissa Cookston is the pit master of Yazoo's Delta Q Memphis and May coming up this weekend. Uh, we have a whole nother segment that we're going to be doing here in the, in the next uh, small time frame uh, where we can actually talk about Memphis Barbecue Company and steak, if that's all right with you. That's fine. Yeah, we're not even talking about that tonight because big Memphis and May stuff doing, but uh, obviously the, the restaurant stuff is going very well for you, and I would love to catch up with that. Uh, this is Melissa Cookson. We wish you great success this coming weekend, and uh, I always appreciate you coming on the show, Melissa. Thanks so much. Thank you. You got it. There she is, Melissa Cookson, pointing towards Memphis in May. Will she All make number four? On the Barbecue Central Show appear Will via she? the Smithfield Hotline. Wow. Yummy. Let me tell you something. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of whole hogs in my day. She was pumping me up with what she's doing to make that up. By the way, I don't know if anybody caught what that hog is eating or what those piglets are eating. I don't know if I wrote down everything, but I believe I heard marshmallows, oats, and molasses if you need it. Uh -oh. Let me tell you what, you feed me that diet, I might bring you grand championship at Memphis and Met. You never know. <laughs> Uh, thanks again to Melissa Cookston for coming on, and good luck to Yazoo's Delta Q. Shout out to Pete Cookston, by the way. Shout. Pete, what's up? All right, folks, let me talk to you quickly about the pit barrel cooker. That's right. If you're looking to pull the trigger on a new cooker, it can be nerve-wracking sometimes. I get it. Temperature control, fire management, what woods to buy. Who needs the hassle? Might I strongly suggest a pit barrel cooker? The Pit Barrel makes cooking simple and fun. It just might be the most unique and versatile, easy-to-use cooker available on the market today. Imagine a single cooker that turns out the great traditional barbecue meats, but also ramps up and temp to do burgers, chicken wings, and hot dogs. This is all thanks to the hook and hang method that puts the meat right in the center of the heat, acting like a stationary rotisserie. This gives you consistency each and every time. Not only is the Pit Barrel a fabulous cooking vessel, it's aesthetically sexy as well. Built to withstand heat, thanks to its porcelain enamel finish, the pit barrel able to withstand any type of weather condition. Also extremely portable, fits in the track, fits in the back of most trucks, vans, and SUVs. It's basically ready to go wherever you are. Of course, all barbecue folks love accessories, and the pit barrel doesn't dif differ, uh, disappoint. Doesn't disappoint here either. You got hinged grill grates. You got your own chimney starter sized for the pit barrel cooker you got beer koozies you got coffee mugs pit grips removable ash pans rubs the list goes on and on it really complements your pit barrel cooking experience here's the best part for 299 dollars the pit barrel comes fully assembled ready to cook on and it ships for free right to your door not only does the cooker ship free but with so few returns everything they sell ships free to lower 48 continental states each and every day no promo code no coupon code need it thank you for coming don't take my word for it the folks at amazingribs.com give the pit barrel cooker a top 10 rating in their gold division 
That's the highest rating, by the way. Not once, not twice, not three times, four times in a row. Head on over to pitbarrelcooker.com and see what everybody's talking about. 502-228-1222, pitbarrel.com. We'll be back right after this to wrap the show. Stick around. Whole Packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injection butts. You've never heard this before. You might think you found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Greg Rippey. Welcome back. This segment brought to you by the National Pro Barbecue Tour, presented by Sam's Club. Uh, 31 cities, 500000 in cash. Eternal bragging rights if you win the whole damn thing. This weekend, the 2017 Pro Barbecue Tour rolls into Marietta, Georgia for a local qualifier. To get more info on the tour, register your team to compete or check results. You can visit kcbs.us slash Sam's Tour. That's kcbs.us slash Sam's Tour. Thanks again to Melissa Cookson for joining me on the show and talking about Memphis and May as well. All right, uh, very quickly, this past Friday, barbecue legend Chris Marks from Three Little Pigs, shout out to Chris, gave a ribs class on a Friday morning slash afternoon over at the Heat Exchange just west of Cleveland, and he allowed me to stop by, got to hang out for a few hours, taste some great ribs. He was doing country style ribs he did st louis style spare ribs and he also did beef ribs i did not get a chance to try the beef ribs because i wasn't working it was friday by the way all those people in the class what the hell are you doing i didn't see my boy keith harris from kryptonite barbecue up from the general canton area he said he took the day off, so he gets a pass. But was everybody else playing hooky? I mean, what are you doing on a Friday at 10 o'clock in the morning? I'm trying to sell Class 8 vehicles by the boatload. You guys are enjoying Chris Mark's stories, anecdotes, and barbecue wisdom. If you've never taken to Chris Mark's class... And I'm sure he's more than happy to, to give competition-style recommendations as well or classes. But this is for the backyard person. If you really want to hone in, dial in the backyard barbecue, look for Chris Marks. He travels all over the country. If you have a mom-and-pop location, like a heat exchange or whatever it is called in your neck of the woods, look for Chris or email him. He'll probably help you find somewhere that would be able to put a class together. There was, I don't know, 25 people or so that were in the class, the ribs class. He was turning right around and doing another class the next day at the heat exchange again. Not sure what that was covering, but that was a ribs class. So I would say as somebody who was able to spectate for free, and I should say thank you to the heat exchange for allowing me to do that. They could have easily charged me money. But uh, a great place if you're over on the west side of Cleveland to check out an uh, extensive line of grills. They have pellet smokers. They have Kamado styles as well. They do carry the, uh, the good one smoker that Chris manufactures with Landmark. So if you see Chris, you see one of his classes, I highly recommend it. A lot of people that I know that are very good barbecue cooks take his classes and rave about the information, the uh, economics of it is very nice when you compare it to some of these other classes. But again, not a competition cooking class, but it will help you step up the backyard game extensively. So thanks again to Chris for allowing me to stop in last Friday. Very fun. Always good to see him. By the way, as I pointed out, he actually allowed me to get up in front of the class and introduce myself and tell him what I was doing here in Cleveland, which was completely unexpected and much appreciated. Uh, that I had seen Chris now twice Inside of three months, I met him for the first time in person at the Hearth Patio and Barbecue show, and uh, then I saw him at the heat exchange a few months later. How about that? Never happened. All right, here we go. Let's get out quickly. All the way back in the first hour, Max Good talking about the Timberline Grill again, the rating on that one. Silver for now. Then we talked with Chris Lilly from Big Bob Gibson shooting for number five this coming weekend. We'll see how that goes. Memphis and May. Good luck to him. Then we talked with Joe Heitzberg. At 1014, crowd cow. Tip a cow, let's all buy horses. Uh, horses. 
Let's all buy horses together. Let's all buy cows together or steer. Crowdcow.com, check it out. And uh, Melissa Cookston helped me close the show tonight. Uh, good luck to her as well with that hybrid hog deal she's got going. Light fat. Sound delicious. A big show lined up already for next week. Hopefully we'll get a Memphis and May winner or interview. However, I'll figure that out because we are jam-packed. September 11, 2001. I will never forget until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now.